Sannyasa is the life stage of renunciation within the Hindu philosophy of four age-based life stages known as ashramas, with the first three being brahmacharya bachelor student, grihastha householder, and vanaprastha forest dweller, retired. Sannyasa is traditionally conceptualized for men or women in late years of their life, but young brahmacharis have had the choice to skip the householder and retirement stages, renounce worldly and materialistic pursuits and dedicate their lives to spiritual pursuits. Sannyasa is a form of asceticism, is marked by renunciation of material desires and prejudices, represented by a state of disinterest and detachment from material life, and has the purpose of spending one's life in peaceful, love-inspired, simple spiritual life. An individual in sannyasa is known as a sannyasi male or sannyasini female in Hinduism, which in many ways parallel to the sadhu and sadhvi traditions of Jain monasticism, the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis of Buddhism and the monk and nun traditions of Christianity, respectively. Sannyasa has historically been a stage of renunciation, ahimsa non-violence, peaceful and simple life and spiritual pursuit in Indian traditions. However, this has not always been the case. After the invasions and establishment of Muslim rule in India, from the 12th century through the British Raj, parts of the Shaiva and Vaishnava ascetics metamorphosed into a military order, to rebel against persecution, where they developed martial arts, created military strategies, and engaged in guerrilla warfare. These warrior sannyasis ascetics played an important role in helping European colonial powers establish themselves in India. Etymology and synonyms Samnyasha in Sanskrit nyasa means purification, sannyasa means purification of everything. It is a composite word of sam which means together, all, ni which means down, and asa from the root as, meaning to throw, or to put. A literal translation of sannyasa is thus, to put down everything, all of it. Sannyasa is sometimes spelled as sannyasa. The term samnyasa makes appearance in the Samhitas, Aranyakas, and Brahmanas, the earliest layers of Vedic literature, second millennium BCE, but it is rare. It is not found in ancient Buddhist or Jaina vocabularies, and only appears in Brahmanical literature of the first millennium BCE, in the context of those who have given up ritual activity and taken up non ritualistic spiritual pursuits discussed in the Upanishads. The term sannyasa evolves into a rite of renunciation in ancient sutra texts, and thereafter became a recognized, well discussed stage of life ashrama by about the 3rd and 4th century CE. In Dravidian languages, sannyasi is pronounced as sannyasi and also sannyasi in colloquial form. Sannyasis are also known as bhiksu, pravrahita, pravrahita, yati, sramana, and parivrajika in Hindu texts. History Jameson and Witzel state early Vedic texts make no mention of sannyasa, or ashrama system, unlike the concepts of Brahmakaran and Grihastha which they do mention. Instead, Rig Veda uses the term antigriya in hymn 10.95.4, still part of extended family, where older people lived in ancient India, with an outwardly role. It is in later Vedic era and over time, sannyasa and other new concepts emerged, while older ideas evolved and expanded. A three-stage ashrama concept along with Vanaprastha emerged about or after 7th century BC, when sages such as Yajñavakya left their homes and roamed around as spiritual recluses and pursued their pravrajika wanderer lifestyle. The explicit use of the four-stage ashrama concept, appeared a few centuries later, however, early Vedic literature from 2nd millennium BC, mentions Muni, Muni monks, mendicants, holy man, with characteristics that mirror those found in later sannyasins and sannyasinis. Rig Veda, for example, in Book 10 Chapter 136, mentions Munis as those with Kesan, Kesan long-haired and Mala clothes, Mala soil-colored, yellow, orange, saffron engaged in the affairs of Mananat mind, meditation. Rigveda, however, refers to these people as Muni and Vadi, Vadi monks who beg. Kesianim Kesi Visam Kesi Bibharti Rodasa Kesi Visvam Sverders Kesidam Jyotirasyate, Munayo Vitarasana Pasanga Visate Mala Vedasyano Drajim Yanti Yadaveso Avaksata, he with the long loose locks of hair supports Agni, and moisture, heaven, and earth, he is all sky to look upon, he with long hair is called this light. 
The munis, girdled with the wind, wear garments of soil hue, they, following the wind's swift course, go where the gods have gone before. These munis, their lifestyle and spiritual pursuit, likely influenced the sannyasa concept, as well as the ideas behind the ancient concept of brahmacharya bachelor student. One class of munis were associated with rudra. Another were vratyas. Lifestyle and goals Hinduism has no formal demands nor requirements on the lifestyle or spiritual discipline, method or deity a sannyasin or sannyasini must pursue, it is left to the choice and preferences of the individual. This freedom has led to diversity and significant differences in the lifestyle and goals of those who adopt sannyasa. There are, however, some common themes. A person in sannyasa lives a simple life, typically detached, itinerant, drifting from place to place, with no material possessions or emotional attachments. They may have a walking stick, a book, a container or vessel for food and drink, often wearing yellow, saffron, orange, ochre or soil-colored clothes. They may have long hair and appear disheveled, and are usually vegetarians. Some minor Upanishads as well as monastic orders consider women, children, students, fallen men those with a criminal record and others as not qualified to become sannyasa, while other texts place no restrictions. The dress, the equipage and lifestyle varies between groups. For example, Sannyasa Upanishad in verses 2.23 to 2.29, identifies six lifestyles for six types of renunciates. One of them is described as living with the following possessions, Pot, drinking cup and flask, the three supports, a pair of shoes, a patched robe giving protection, in heat and cold, a loin cloth, bathing drawers and straining cloth, triple staff and coverlet. Those who enter sannyasa may choose whether they join a group mendicant order. Some are anchorites, homeless mendicants preferring solitude and seclusion in remote parts, without affiliation. Others are cenobites, living and traveling with kindred fellow sannyasi in the pursuit of their spiritual journey, sometimes in ashramas or matha, sangha, hermitages, monastic order. Most Hindu ascetics adopt celibacy when they begin sannyasa. However, there are exceptions, such as the Saiva Tantra school of asceticism, where ritual sex is considered part of liberation process. Sex is viewed by them as a transcendence from a personal, intimate act to something impersonal and ascetic. The goal The goal of the Hindu sannyasin is moksha liberation. The idea of what that means varies from tradition to tradition. Who am I, and in what really do I consist? What is this cage of suffering? For the bhakti devotion traditions, liberation consists of union with the divine and release from samsara rebirth in future life. For yoga traditions, liberation is the experience of the highest samadhi deep awareness in this life, and for the Advaita tradition, liberation is jivanmukti, the awareness of the supreme reality Brahman and self-realization in this life. Sannyasa is a means and an end in itself. It is a means to decreasing and then ultimately ending all ties of any kind. It is a means to the soul and meaning, but not ego nor personalities. Sannyasa does not abandon the society, it abandons the ritual mores of the social world and one's attachment to all its other manifestations. The end is a liberated, content, free and blissful existence. The behaviors and characteristics The behavioral state of a person in sannyasa is described by many ancient and medieval era Indian texts. Bhagavad Gita discusses it in many verses, for example, Janya sa nityasanyasi yo na divesti na khan kasati nirdvanavo hai mahabaho sukham bandhapramuchyate. He is known as a permanent sannyasin who does not hate, does not desire, is without dualities. Opposites. Truly, Mahabaho, Arjuna, he is liberated from bondage. Other behavioral characteristics, in addition to renunciation, during sannyasa include, ahimsa non-violence, akrata not become angry even if you are abused by others, disarmament no weapons, chastity, bachelorhood no marriage, aviati non-desirous, amadi poverty, self-restraint, truthfulness, sarvabuddhahita kindness to all creatures, asteya non-stealing, aparagraha non-acceptance of gifts, non-possessiveness and shacha purity of body speech and mind. 
Some Hindu monastic orders require the above behavior in form of a vow, before a renunciate can enter the order. Tawari notes that these virtues are not unique to sannyasa, and other than renunciation, all of these virtues are revered in ancient texts for all four ashramas stages of human life. Badayana Dharmasutra, completed by about 7th century BC, states the following behavioral vows for a person in sannyasa. These are the vows a sannyasi must keep. Abstention from injuring living beings, truthfulness, abstention from appropriating the property of others, abstention from sex, liberality, kindness, gentleness are the major vows. There are five minor vows, abstention from anger, obedience towards the guru, avoidance of rashness, cleanliness, and purity in eating. He should beg for food without annoying others, any food he gets he must compassionately share a portion with other living beings, sprinkling the remainder with water he should eat it as if it were a medicine. Topic. Types Ashrama Upanishad identified various types of sannyasi renouncers based on their different goals Kudichaka, seeking atmospheric world, Bahudaka, seeking heavenly world, Hamsa, seeking penance world, Paramahamsa, seeking truth world, and Tariyaditas and Avidudas seeking liberation in this life. In some texts, such as Sannyasa Upanishad, these were classified by the symbolic items the sannyasins carried and their lifestyle. For example, Kutichaka sannyasis carried triple staffs, Hamsa sannyasis carried single staffs, while Paramahamsas went without them. This method of classification based on emblematic items became controversial, as anti-thematic to the idea of renunciation. Later texts, such as Narada Paravrajika Upanishad stated that all renunciation is one, but people enter the state of sannyasa for different reasons, for detachment and getting away from their routine meaningless world, to seek knowledge and meaning in life, to honor rites of sannyasa they have undertaken, and because he already has liberating knowledge. Other classifications There were many groups of Hindu, Jain and Buddhist sannyasis co-existing in pre-Maurya Empire era, each classified by their attributes, such as, Achalakas without clothes, Ahivika, Avarudaka, Devadhamika, Eka Satakas, Gautamaka, Jatalaka, Magandika, Mundasavaka, Nigrantha Jains, Paribhajaka, Tedandikas, Tithya and others. Literature The Dharmasutras and Dharmasastras, composed about mid-first millennium BC and later, place increasing emphasis on all four stages of ashrama system including sannyasa. The Bhadhyana Dharmasutra, in verses 2.11.9-2.11.12, describes the four ashramas as a fourfold division of dharma. The older Dharmasutras, however, are significantly different in their treatment of ashramas system from the more modern Dharmasastras, because they do not limit some of their ashrama rituals to dvija men, that is, the three varnas, brahmins, kshatriyas and vaishyas. The newer Dharmasastra vary widely in their discussion of ashrama system in the context of classes castes, with some mentioning it for three, while others such as Vihanasa Dharmasutra including all four, the Dharmasutras and Dharmasastras give a number of detailed but widely divergent guidelines on renunciation. In all cases, sannyasa was never mandatory and was one of the choices before an individual. Only a small percentage chose this path. Olivelle posits that the older Dharmasutras present the ashramas including sannyasa as four alternative ways of life and options available, but not a sequential stage that any individual must follow. Olivelle also states that sannyasa along with the ashrama system gained mainstream scholarly acceptance about 2nd century BC. Ancient and medieval era texts of Hinduism consider grihastha householder stage as the most important of all stages in sociological context, as human beings in this stage not only pursue a virtuous life, they produce food and wealth that sustains people in other stages of life, as well as the offsprings that continues mankind. However, an individual had the choice to renounce any time he or she wanted, including straight after student life. When can a person renounce? 
Bhadhyana Dharmasutra, in verse 2.10.17.2 states that anyone who has finished brahmacharya student life stage may become ascetic immediately, in 2.10.17.3 that any childless couple may enter sannyasa anytime they wish, while verse 2.10.17.4 states that a widower may choose sannyasa if desired, but in general, states verse 2.10.17.5, sannyasa is suited after the completion of of age 70 and after one's children have been firmly settled. Other texts suggest the age of 75, the Vasistha and Apastamba Dharmasutras, and the later Manasmurta describe the asramas as sequential stages which would allow one to pass from Vedic studentship to householder to forest-dwelling hermit to renouncer. However, these texts differ with each other. Yajñavakya Smrta, for example, differs from Manasmurta and states in verse 3.56 that one may skip Vanaprastha forest dwelling, retired stage and go straight from the Grihastha householder stage to sannyasa. <laughs> Who may renounce? The question as to which varna may, or may not, renounce is never explicitly stated in ancient or medieval Dharma literature. The more modern Dharmasastras texts discuss much of renunciation stage in context of Dvija men. Nevertheless, Dharmasastra texts document people of all castes as well as women, entered sannyasa in practice. <laughs> what happened to renouncers' property and human rights? After renouncing the world, the ascetic's financial obligations and property rights were dealt by the state, just like a dead person. Visnu Smriti in verse 6.27, for example, states that if a debtor takes sannyasa, his sons or grandsons should settle his debts. As to the little property a sannyasin may collect or possess after renunciation, Book 3 Chapter 16 of Kautilya's Arthashastra states that the property of hermits vanaprastha, ascetics yati, sannyasa, and student bachelors brahmachari shall on their death be taken by their guru, disciples, their dharmabratri brother in the monastic order, or classmates in succession. Although a renouncer's practitioner's obligations and property rights were reassigned, he or she continued to enjoy basic human rights such as the protection from injury by others others and the freedom to travel. Likewise, someone practicing sannyasa was subject to the same laws as common citizens. Stealing, harming, or killing a human being by a sannyasi were all serious crimes in Kautilya's Arthashastra. <inaudible> Renunciation in daily life Later Indian literature debates whether the benefit of renunciation can be achieved moksha, or liberation without asceticism in the earlier stages of one's life. For example, Bhagavad Gita, Vidyaranya's Javanmukti Viveka, and others believed that various alternate forms of yoga and the importance of yogic discipline could serve as paths to spirituality, and ultimately moksha. Over time, four paths to liberating spirituality have emerged in Hinduism, Jnana Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, Karma Yoga and Raja Yoga. Acting without greed or craving for results, in karma yoga for example, is considered a form of detachment in daily life similar to sannyasa. Sharma states that, "...the basic principle of karma yoga is that it is not what one does, but how one does it that counts and if one has the know-how in this sense, one can become liberated by doing whatever it is one does." And, "...one must do whatever one does without attachment to the results, with efficiency and to the best of one's ability." Warrior ascetics Ascetic life was historically a life of renunciation, non-violence and spiritual pursuit. However, in India, this has not always been the case. For example, after the Mongol and Persian Islamic invasions in the 12th century, and the establishment of Delhi Sultanate, the ensuing Hindu-Muslim conflicts provoked the creation of a military order of Hindu ascetics in India. These warrior ascetics, formed paramilitary groups called akaras and they invented a range of martial arts. Nath Siddhas of the 12th century AD, may have been the earliest Hindu monks to resort to a military response after the Muslim conquest. Ascetics, by tradition, led a nomadic and unattached lifestyle. As these ascetics dedicated themselves to rebellion, their groups sought stallions, developed techniques for spying and targeting, and they adopted strategies of war against Muslim nobles and the Sultanate state. 
Many of these groups were devotees of Hindu deity Mahadeva, and were called Mahants. Other popular names for them was sannyasis, yogis, nagas followers of Shiva, bayaragas followers of Vishnu and Gosains from 1500 to 1800 AD. In some cases, these Hindu monks cooperated with Muslim fakirs who were Sufi and also persecuted. Warrior monks continued their rebellion through the Mughal Empire and became a political force during the early years of British Raj. In some cases, these regiments of soldier monks shifted from guerrilla campaigns to war alliances, and these Hindu warrior monks played a key role in helping British establish themselves in India. The significance of warrior ascetics rapidly declined with the consolidation of British Raj in late 19th century, and with the rise in non violence movement by Mahatma Gandhi. Novetsky states that some of these Hindu warrior ascetics were treated as folk heroes, aided by villagers and townspeople, because they targeted figures of political and economic power in a discriminatory state, and some of these warriors paralleled Robin Hood's lifestyle. Sannyasa Upanishads Of the 108 Upanishads of the Muktika, the largest corpus is dedicated to sannyasa and to yoga, or about 20 each, with some overlap. The renunciation-related texts are called the Sannyasa Upanishads. These are as follows Among the 13 major or principal Upanishads, all from the ancient era, many include sections related to sannyasa. For example, the motivations and state of a sannyasi are mentioned in Maitrayani Upanishad, a classical major Upanishad that Robert Hume included among his list of 13 principal Upanishads of Hinduism. Maitrayani starts with the question, Given the nature of life, how is joy possible? And, How can one achieve moksha? Liberation? In later sections, it offers a debate on possible answers and its views on sannyasa. In this body infected with passions, anger, greed, delusion, fright, despondency, grudge, separation from what is dear and desirable, attachment to what is not desirable, hunger, thirst, old age, death, illness, sorrow and the rest, how can one experience only joy? Him I.3 the drying up of great oceans, the crumbling down of the mountains, the instability of the pole star, the tearing of the wind cords, the sinking down, the submergence of the earth, the tumbling down of the gods from their place, in a world in which such things occur, how can one experience only joy? Him I.4 Dragged away and polluted by the river of the gunas personality, one becomes rootless, tottering, broken down, greedy, uncomposed and falling in the delusion of I-consciousness, he imagines, I am this, this is mine and binds himself, like a bird in the net. Him v.30 Just as the fire without fuel comes to rest in its place, so also the passive mind comes to rest in its source. When it mind is infatuated by the objects of sense, he falls away from truth and acts. Mind alone is the samsara, one should purify it with diligence. You are what your mind is, a mystery, a perpetual one. The mind which is serene, cancels all actions good and bad. He, who, himself, serene, remains steadfast in himself, he attains imperishable happiness. Him v.34 Six of the Sannyasa Upanishads, Aruni, Kundika, Kathashruti, Paramahamsa, Jabala and Brahma, were composed before the 3rd century CE, likely in the centuries before or after the start of the Common Era, states Sprakhoff. The Asrama Upanishad is dated to the 3rd century, the Narada Paravrajika and Satyayaniya Upanishads to around the 12th century, and about ten of the remaining Sannyasa Upanishads are dated to have been composed in the 14th to 15th century CE well after the start of Islamic Sultan its period of South Asia in late 12th century, the oldest sannyasa Upanishads have a strong Advaita Vedanta outlook, and these pre-date Adi Shankara. Most of the sannyasa Upanishads present a yoga and non-dualism Vedanta philosophy. This may be, states Patrick Olivell, because major Hindu monasteries of early medieval period first millennium CE belong to the Advaita Vedanta tradition. The 12th century Shatyayaniya Upanishad is a significant exception, which presents qualified dualistic and Vaishnavism philosophy. See also <laughs> <laughs> Notes <laughs>